what if I go back to my past self and say, hey, guess what? This all works out. All these things that you're concerned about, all this time you're putting in, it's worth it. You're not wasting it. How's it going, everybody? Welcome. You're listening to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 638. If you don't know me, I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show, founder of Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts and traditional martial artists, probably people like you. If you're listening, there's a good shot that you love something about the traditional arts, and that's why we're here, to support you in all the things that make training and personal growth and all that stuff rewarding. And if you want to see what I mean, if you want to go deeper, understand all the stuff that we've got going on, because it's a long list, go to whistlekick.com. That's where you're going to see a full list of our products and our projects. And if one of those products strikes a nerve, something that you want to pick up, either to support us or to support yourself, use the code PODCAST15. It's going to save you 15% on all of it. And you know what? I never say this, but almost everything is free shipping. Apparel is free global shipping. Everything else is free U.S. shipping. Just it's the way it goes. So check it out. The show gets its own website, whistlecakemartialartsradio.com. Two new episodes each and every week with the goal of connecting, educating, and entertaining you and maybe your friends that you train with, maybe your family. Anybody out there, we're here for you. If you want to help the show, well, you could buy something. You could tell people about it. You could sign up for the newsletter. You could leave us a review. You could buy a book. You could buy a uniform or a shirt. Or you could support our Patreon, P-A-E-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Whistlekick. You throw a couple bucks our way, we're going to throw you some bonus content. You throw a couple more bucks, we're going to throw you more bonus content. And it scales up from there. People rarely stop their Patreon contributions, which tells me we are doing something right in the vein of delivering value. It's all about value. We try to give you as much value as we can out of everything that we produce. Today's guest is a passionate martial artist. Big shock, right? Just about everybody we bring on is. He's also an author. And he's an incredibly insightful person who's spent a lot of time thinking about and talking about martial arts, which if you know anything about me and where I tend to go on this show, you know that that led to a wonderful conversation and one that you're going to enjoy. Here we go. Joe, how are you? Well, hello and good morning. I'm wonderful. That is succinct and awesome. People usually don't answer so positively. You you sound very level, very uh, almost stoic. You know, uh, my wife, um, I tell her it's her job in our marriage to be the excited one. <laughs> <laughs> Did she take that to heart? Uh, yeah, she does her best. She expects me to be excited about the things happening to me. Uh, I always have some reservations i uh i always take everything uh with a grain of salt you know and uh however things work out they work out Mm. you always been like that so getting older has really helped (laughs) (laughs) like many of us on a martial arts journey uh maybe in our younger years we were fueled by different things Mm. and um uh, i have pleasantly found that I've become a much more uh, measured and emotionally mature person as I've gotten older, uh, as opposed to the Ronin that I was in my early 20s. I can I can hear the suppressed laughter in your voice. You're definitely thinking <laughs> about some specific things. Oh, definitely. <laughs> I, we can talk about those things if you like. We, we can, <laughs> Hey, if, if you've got something you want to share, I, I am I'm game to listen. Well, I I don't know if you want to discuss the timeline of my martial arts career, but like, uh, I I think I take a lot of comfort. A lot of people are disturbed that their stories are not unique. We like to think that we are uh, special in the universe, but I'm actually comforted uh, to know that many people have gone through what I have gone through uh, or am going through because it's reassuring to me they did it, and so can I. Yeah. Um, so when I was in my early 20s, I've been training at that point for more than 15 years. Uh, at the time, I was training in a uh, a very rough and tumble uh, form of uh, Wing Chun. And uh, my instructor, 
Sifu, uh, Sifu Sean Paul, he said, uh, now is the time for you to go out into the world to get away from uh, the school where everyone is sort of uh, sparring by the same rules and see if this applies when you touch hands with people of, of various disciplines. And I did so. Uh, there was a time in my 20s where I had, uh, I still have it, a big black duffel bag uh, packed with two sets of sparring gear and everything else uh, a budding uh, martial artist uh, could want. Uh, and I would, uh, I would get in there with just about anybody and um, learn a lot. And I'd get very excited. Um, like if I was going to spar, I sparred a, a, a few gentlemen that were skilled in capoeira. And I just, I was so excited about what I was going to experience. Uh, the unknown was upon me. And uh, I thought it was a refreshing approach from a martial arts instructor because he was unconcerned uh, that he hadn't been showing me truth. He, he wasn't worried that if I got out there uh, out of a controlled environment, that what I had been training would, would lose its, its uh, practical application. And it was, mm. uh, it was a good time for me. I don't know at this age if I would do that anymore. <laughs> Did you have the same context for it then? Or is it only in hindsight that you really appreciate that learning experience? At the time, um, I, this was, okay, so this was the late, uh, 1990s, mm -hmm. um, uh, clean living and, uh, I have never stopped training, uh, fairly intensely to this day. I still train six days a week. Wow. Um, here in the, I had, in my basement, I have a, um, a 12 by 16, uh, like college grade wrestling mat with my, uh, heavy bag and my mukjong, And I still have people over to train in various disciplines. Um, but now that I'm older, I vet people a little more carefully. I think we've all had the experience where you don't really know somebody <laughs> and, um, you're not really sure what you're getting. And, um, uh, the experience of a three minute warrior, someone who wants to come in and give it his all for uh, a round and then uh, say, thank you. That was great. And then leave. You're like, you know, I was pacing myself here, friend, and <laughs> you made me fight for my life and now you're leaving. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, I, I liked uh, when I was training Wing Chun, um, at that time for me, the, uh, philosophical approaches behind Wing Chun agreed with my young mindset. You know, um, I think as a lot of us get older, we start to value, um, the intangibles in martial arts more. And I think when we're younger, uh, people when you hear this system is uh simple it's efficient it's practical it's scientific um it's it's all the tangible things in the universe um especially when you are not advanced yet and you start to realize the value uh of intangibles and how advanced technique um is instinctual and also artistic uh in a way that you just you don't you're you're when you're training you're getting your palette right you're putting your palette together and then well after years of training and and sparring then you're able to really paint in a way that you never thought you would be able to paint that you didn't even know you were going to be a painter 
you've used that analogy before it sounds like uh well um actually that uh that's a new one oh i i am an author um so you're gonna get this out of me some of them are gonna sound really good and some of them are gonna need a second or third draft that's okay uh, which is if the it was all be- perfect the first time you, you said anything you know I'd, I'd i'd start to be concerned i feel <laughs> like you were given the same interview over and over oh no no um you know and one of the as someone who writes i also read a lot you know and i'm i'm so interested in uh martial arts writing because as someone who has a large collection of martial arts books um you get a uh, uh, varying quality when you yes. try different martial arts books um i remember in the late 90s being very excited by the publisher tuttle because they were just putting out some incredible uh, martial arts books. Uh, some of Bruce Lee's uh, books uh, in, in a different format than we'd seen before. And then, uh, and then beautiful books like uh, The Complete Wing Chun, Complete Kendo. They were just putting out an incredible product. And I thought, this is what I've been looking for for so long. Do you Shout remember out. your first martial arts book? Wow. Or, or, or maybe that's not quite the question. I mean, how about the first one that was really impactful? Yeah. Um, so I started training pretty young. I was about uh, eight years old. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a giant comic book fan. And uh, I would love a comic book with a great martial arts scene in it. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, when you get older, you start to uh, look at those artists and you start to see who were martial artists. You recognize techniques. Uh, you see, you see their, their uh, passion for martial arts in their work. Uh, so I loved different comics. Um, but I think, like many of us, I wish I had a unique answer but it was probably Bruce Lee's uh, Tao of Jeet Kune Do. The big oversized edition. Do you remember how old you were? Uh, yeah, I was 16. Okay. I, uh, this is before... It's an influential have... age. I, I know a lot of people who have read, reread, re-reread until the spine fell apart yes. that book at that age. Yes. Uh, well, you get your driver's license. This is before you can get books delivered to your home. Sure. Uh, sure. And no one can stop you from buying a book anymore if you can find it. <laughs> if that makes any sense. It does. It does. I bet to this audience, it makes a lot of sense. Yes. Yes. Well, what a great book. Uh, and uh, what a wonderful way to sneak some philosophy in. Um, yeah which has become my favorite part of, of Bruce Lee's writing sense uh, is, is his philosophy. How much do you think you understood it then? Oh boy, not at all. Um, I wanted to understand it. Um, I wanted to understand the mechanical things Lee was talking about. Um, there is a, there is some drawings of what he considers to be the ideal on guard stance in, in that book. And uh, I tried to emulate that stance and it felt like the most awkward (laughs) stance possible. You're kind of twisted sideways. You have one hand down protecting your groin, the other hands up in a knife hand, your shoulders turned in. It's uh, you're like, what is this? How do you move at all? (laughs) I've seen that picture. Uh-huh. And yeah. uh you th- this is before you uh as I got older I could be more active in sparring. You know, you get out of point sparring, you start free sparring more. And then you start to realize this is it, this isn't a static position. This is a this is a transitory this is a position you're just hitting in transition sometimes. And then uh when you learn a few other things at Wing Chun for me, it was the, the Bong Sao technique. Um, you know, 
bong sao. You, it's a it's a great technique on film. So you see it in a lot of movies. Uh, but it, it shares a lot of principles with boxing shoulder roll. And then you start to realize that's what the stance is trying to imply. It's trying to imply the use of the shoulder roll. And then it's, things begin to make a little more sense. Yeah. What was it like making that transition from point sparring to more free sparring and getting to implement some of those things that I suspect you understood on an intellectual level, or at least thought you did. And, but then you got the opportunity to put them into practice. And as we all know, when you put things into practice, you go, oh, I, I, yes. I didn't really understand. What was that experience like? Well, so I came up, um, I started doing um, uh, judo at the, the Boys and Girls Club of America mm -hmm. as a, a little guy, as a grade schooler. Um, so my experience started more with free, with more free live sparring at the, at the judo level. And then I transitioned into more point fighting disciplines, uh, Taekwondo and then, uh, Kyushin Karate. So Kyushin's a little more, you know, with, with point fighting, you, you're only concerned about getting the point and not so much about after, um, Right. There's and a dead stop. You got to be careful. And that transition is jarring, um, especially, and I'm sure other people have this experience, being a younger person thrown in there with an older person. Um, I grew up in the Detroit metro area, and the brand of martial artist in that area is a rough and tumble brand. These were factory workers. <laughs> So strong, strong men and women, um, blue collar men and women who didn't take no guff. And uh, they, they didn't like the idea of a cocky teenager getting anything in on them. Mm. The transition. Um, so uh, I firmly believe life imitates art. Um, I found martial arts by watching films, watching television shows, and I just, I want to do that. So I remember, uh, this is in the nineties, so you couldn't really get Jackie Chan films. You kind of got what you got. Uh, so in 1992, uh, Brandon Lee's rapid fire came out and I loved this movie. And um, there is a sequence at the end of Rapid Fire uh, where Brandon Lee employs uh, some Wing Chun trapping. It's a beautiful scene. Uh, it's, it's well shot. It's cleanly shot. Uh, great music. And I thought, whatever he is doing here, I have to learn this. Uh, so I started looking into it and found out it was, it was Wing Chun. And uh, I met uh, someone who was very pivotal. We all have that instructor who was very pivotal in our martial arts education. And mine was Sean Paul, who was a, a Wing Chun instructor. And he really stressed not stopping, just keep going. Don't always protect yourself. And and always be doing something. I remember I'd be sparring and I would, I would do some trapping hands and uh, get in a good position and, and maybe, maybe land a, a, few, a few clean techniques. And he would say, uh, what are you doing? Uh, keep going. You need to keep going um, until this person gets themselves out of trouble and they need to get themselves out of trouble and they need to learn how. So you're helping them. Hmm. Okay. I'm with you. Yeah, he was always trying to get us. He was, he was an a instructor in pursuit of the truth. What he, do you mean by that? He was, uh, in a way, following the Lee timeline. Uh, where he was trying to 
he was an older at the time I know now he was in his forties and, uh, he was finding what worked for him. Um, but he was also not only trying to find where, uh, technique met practicality, but also find the practicality in techniques where we might have lost that. So he would be analyzing different hand trapping techniques. Um, you know, he had gone to China uh, uh, before I met him in the mid 90s and trained over there. He had a strong lineage. And I guess I have a strong lineage too, uh, when I think about it that way. Yeah. And he would, he would, you know, for those of us that, for Wing Chun in, in particular, there, there are many famous books, you know, the uh, Ip Man's uh, 108 Movements book uh, for, for the wooden man. And you look at it and you're trying to see what he was getting at, but in a static image, it's difficult. And he was, he was finding what people were using in live practice. And then he was trying to not just find shortcuts, but find where those old techniques that have been left by the wayside were supposed to fit. Um, and to this day, when I watch uh, like a, a mixed martial arts match and I see a hand trapping technique, I, I look and I go, well, there it is. You know, uh, like Bruce Lee said, you know, if you, until they invent uh, a, a, a being that does, has more than two arms and two legs, it's, it's all going to boil down to the same stuff. Yep. You know, those are those techniques. They're in there, you know. If I could expand slightly, because my my thoughts are running on this, please. It was this, so this, exciting. This is your episode. You can take it wherever you want. Oh, thanks. It was so exciting to watch the evolution of the UFC and to watch the reintroduction of traditional martial arts techniques. Um, the the UFC ran this timeline where uh, people who were very good at Brazilian Jiu Jitsu did well. And then people who were very good wrestlers did well. Uh, and then those two things sort of became requirements. Mm -hmm. And when you're a good wrestler and you're a good submission artist, uh, you're good at not getting in a bad position and not being submitted. And then that opened up the striking game. And we started to see these martial artists come in like, uh, well, first, you know, George St. Pierre, he was a Koyushin guy. And then Lyoto Machida with uh, almost a modified uh, point fighting uh, approach to fighting. Yeah. What an incredible fighter to watch. Um, an incredibly exciting time to watch. I, I would, every one of his bouts, I would look forward to to see what he was doing. Uh, and then uh, Stephen Thompson. I, I kind of feel was the next generation of fighter to bring that, uh, bring those techniques in. As, and then you start to see things like uh, Edwin Barbosa's wheel kicks. And you're just like, this is so much fun now to, you know, uh, for years and years, uh, I would uh, deal with uh, naysayers that would say, oh, you know, if, if you just don't box, if you just don't do uh, Muay Thai, um, what you're just wasting your time. And uh, I'd say, well, let's find out, you know, and I'd get some gloves on, get padded up, and we'd see where it went. Uh, because I knew that there was room for these techniques, there, that traditional martial arts endured for so long for a reason. Um, and, uh, to see that evolution of the UFC was, it's just so exciting. Um, I, I've always told people it's so interesting to have been a martial artist and, uh, trained and you didn't know what you were getting when you faced off with somebody from different discipline or no discipline. 
Um, and then all of a sudden, it's like the whole world was fighting by my rules. And I just couldn't believe it. It's like, hey, this is great. There's a unified rules of sparring have been um, established uh, during my uh, lifetime. Mm. And, and do you remember at what point you saw that? You, you, uh, you put it together because yeah. I haven't heard it described in that way. And I would imagine that be, because you're a very thoughtful person and I would imagine that you felt defensive of the things that you grew up training, that that yes. realization gave you some hope. Yeah. You're, you're talking about this, yeah. this evolution and, and the space for striking to come in and start finding its own. Yes. Uh, actually I do remember, um, so I would say if I were to pin down uh, a year, I would say this was probably around, um, I would, thinking about it, I would say I started to see it around 2002. Oh, it's been and, a while. And then in 2000, by 2006, um, it seemed like, uh, if you uh, free sparred with someone you didn't know uh, well, uh, they would try uh, a wrestling takedown or they'd try a jiu-jitsu technique or they would throw round kicks. Um, they would throw leg kicks. Um, and you started to know what to expect better out, out of people. Um, because they were, their lives were imitating, not fictional art, but but martial art. They were watching these UFCs, and they were emulating those techniques. And then all of a sudden, uh, you had a subset of people who were fighting almost all the same way, uh, sometimes very predictably, uh, with a with a limited set of techniques. Um, I mean, in this era, the idea of throwing a snap kick, uh, which has gained enormous popularity in the UFC in the last uh, four or five years, particularly with Conor McGregor employing a lot of snap kicks, not thrust kicks, not teep kicks that you see in, in Muay Thai, but almost traditional karate uh, snap kicks, the, the day one kick of karate. Mm. Yep. And here we are, and oh, the awakening of the masses going, this kick really works. Yes, it really works so much that you learn it basically on your first day. Um, and not just because it, those of us who have been instructors, you know, know that it's a great kick to teach, to begin to teach balance. Um, it's a great kick that allows someone to work within their comfortable range of motion without endangering themselves, you know, tipping over or endangering others. And uh, it's adjustable. The yeah. target strike points. Um, you see, so uh, I did get to employ a lot of techniques at that time, uh, snap kicks, side kicks, uh, a little trickier stuff that people just were not familiar with and they were not familiar with where they were presenting those openings, you know, uh, because the round kick uh, is a beautiful tool, but it has its weaknesses, especially the rear round kick. Uh, there's a lot of, it's got to get, it's got to get to its target. It's got a long way to go. So it's pretty I, easy to see coming much of the time. It is. It is, especially if um, I find it so interesting that wrestlers are um, very hip obsessed. Wrestling comes from the hips. Uh, you read techniques from the hips. Um, you hear wrestlers admire other wrestlers discussing their hips. Uh, but uh, then they're they don't know what they're looking at when it comes to striking techniques and the hips and uh the round kick you, you can't do much without the hips in that one
let's uh, let's go back a second. You talked yes. about, and and I remember this time as well. There was this brief time, at least in the history of mixed martial arts, we don't talk a lot about MMA on this show, mm. but where as you as you described, everyone seemed to have the same skill set. It was almost like there was this template. And I remember people talking about it this way. If you want to be good at MMA, you need to be a BJJ purple belt. And you need a couple years of Muay Thai. And ideally you get, you know, a little bit of wrestling and a little bit of boxing and you're good. Mm-hmm. And I would see people talk about it this way. Now, of course, none of those people trained yes more than you know a minute and yes. none of them were ever stepping in a ring yes. because anybody who's actually you know thrown 60 percent power with other people knows that it's it's you can't structure it quite that way yes but i thought i i found it fascinating that once we hit that point and as you described things became very predictable mm-hmm. people started looking for what's What's my X factor going to be? And I remember commentary at UFC matches, not quite describing it this way, but essentially this is what they were saying, you know, but this person also has, you know, six years of Shorinru. So what can we expect for them, you know, from them to to come out of that body of knowledge? And it almost feels like we're going to go not quite full circle because Mm -hmm. at the beginning days of the UFC, you know, there were, there were, not everybody had BJJ experience. Not everybody recognized the need for some wrestling range. But it feels like we're circling back around where it's going to be far more diverse. Yes. Yes. Um, all that. I think uh, also people were choosing disciplines that um, you could learn in just a few years. And they were trying to stick with with a lot of real basic stuff because you had people coming in that were were in for for three years or in that in that range. And one of the things that's greatly undervalued when you are uh, coming up when when you're a novice is footwork and movement. Um, I'm I'm a movement first. Uh, guy, I'm always moving. I'm always angling. It's always the feet first. Um, a lot of times when I'm free sparring with people, they will comment that they just simply can't catch me or get in a position. They feel like I'm already gone. Mm. Um, but when you're at a when you've only been training a few years, your your footwork is not uh enticing if i could footwork no. isn't sexy not at all <laughs> so no not one even wants to learn it but um it's how you keep yourself out of a lot of trouble and it's how you avoid these sort of basic traps of people just rushing you and uh you know how we like to think of uh, strong offense as toughness but a lot of people who are very uh, strongly offensive they're always on the offense it's really from a place of fear it's much easier to just attack a lot and keep up pressure because you're defending by never having to defend if that makes any sense so (laughs) so you run into that too um where people's defenses are very good and they're just kind of throwing it into the wind they don't even want to think about it they just want to come forward and attack a lot and sort of whatever happens happens. <laughs> yeah. Mm. That's a, I, I'm sure a lot of other martial arts relate with uh, that um, transition of yeah. uh, entering. How do I get in? How do I enter? What are my entering techniques? Um, and then becoming a little more comfortable with counter fighting. Um, to this day, I love when I do controlled rounds, I will, uh, one of the things that, that I try to impress as an instructor is to have goals with your rounds. Um, so let's, 
on this con- on this round, I'm going to work on outside techniques. Um, on, I'm going to use a lot of footwork. Um, I'm not going to infight. Okay, on this round, I'm going to counter fight more. Um, I'm going to let you lead, and I'm going to find that. I want to be able to shift gears um, in anything, in any pursuit, the ability to shift gears, to adapt, to have uh, different styles, to fit into different situations is so key. Um, And I've noticed that when I deal with uh, and train with people that have been training for many years, that chess game of shifting gears around of people that have a large toolbox and they're not tied to one approach. Um, those are exciting people to train with. It, it's a lot of fun to train with people. Absolutely. Who don't know. You know I, I like the way you're talking about rounds and putting a focus on those rounds. Because what, one of the things that we're, as martial artists, confronted with today, one of the major conversations we have really is around pressure testing or reality mm-hmm. or whatever words you want to use. Mm-hmm. And there seems to be this extreme camp that thinks if it's not as close to 100% free form, mm-hmm. anything goes, that it's a waste of time. Yes. And what you're talking about, to me, just makes so much sense. Because if you've taught anyone, and I I think the majority of these arguments come from people who don't teach. Mm -hmm. Because anyone who's taught knows that their students, the, the further down the, quote, reality or intensity scale you go, the more they revert back to their patterns, yes. which are not always good patterns. No. How do you break them out of patterns? Do you stand on the side and yell at them while they're getting pummeled? That doesn't work. No. They need the opportunity to get rounds in and practice and unpack whatever that bad habit is to transition into something else. Mm-hmm. I was by no means a talented martial artist. Um, as someone who's trained for years and years in many disciplines, I have felt the frustration. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not frustrated anymore by it. By someone who comes in the school uh, or the Kuhn or, or the gym, wherever you're training, and they are just gifted to just so quickly pick it up. Um, they just, they're not, I was not a talented martial artist. Um, for years and years, I, uh, I would uh, turn away. I would uh, even uh, close my eyes. It took so long for me to break those habits. And it took the patience of my instructors uh, to find and practice ways for me to to break those habits. Um, and uh, targeted rounds is just so good for that. Um, you know, there were these all these budding uh, mixed martial arts gyms in the early 2000s. Uh, because there was there was business there, there was sure. money to be made, um, and I watched uh, as someone who travels the country and would just like to dip into a school and just see what they're doing. I watched that they would just throw these guys in there. They would just, uh, you know, people with very little training, with no goals, with no assignments. They would just say, "All right, let's get in a round." And uh, I don't, you would have to be so gifted to learn that way. Um, And most of us are not that gifted. So I do. Even if you can do it, it's not the most efficient way. Yes. No, it sure isn't. That's very true. Hello, five-year-old. Today, we're going to work on writing. (laughs) Yes. Create a book. Yes. If you get it wrong, I'll hit you. That's essentially yes. what we're doing when when we teach people martial arts in that way. Yes. I remember uh, the first time I did sort of a pursuit round. And uh, it was in Wing Chun because in Wing Chun, uh, Wing Chun has a very uh, 
desired effective distance. It's uh, it's pretty close. And they spend a lot of time trying to achieve that distance. How do we get into trapping range? They don't like to be too far out. They don't like to be too far in. So what, uh, what you do in Wing Chun is you do rounds where someone is trying to escape you and you're sticking to them footwork wise. And you're not just sticking to them, but you're, you're gaining angles while they try to get away. And you don't have to be doing anything with your hands during this period, except for lightly touching to preserve distance. Um, and to, for Wing Chun, you should be able to do it with your eyes closed. It's all off feel. So at a high level. So we would just pursue each other. And then if you were, uh, if you were being chased the next round, you would be the chaser. And then the person trying to get away would be trying to learn things too about how to get away. Um, and it was so uh, such a new experience to do around where it was just all footwork. There was no emphasis on striking whatsoever. It's so valuable, in my opinion. I, I agree. Let's let's switch it up a little bit. Sure. You know, you, you've we've talked a lot about these these points these these I would say big thoughts. You know, yeah. these are things that that I think a lot of martial artists will consider. But I'm going to guess far fewer actually spend contemplative time, as it's clear you have, considering them. That approach to anything, whether it's martial arts or something else, in my experience, usually comes from someone in their past, in their history, helping them understand the value of thoughtful contemplation as a component of growth in whatever the pursuit is. Who was that for you? That's a great question. Okay, so uh, people talk about this with me. I do get uh, pretty real in terms of discussing my past and, and discussing where I came from. And uh, part of my martial arts journey um, was the pursuit of a father figure. Mm. Um, I would wager there are other martial arts uh, martial artists who who, if they were being honest, would say the same thing. They were looking for a role model. They were looking for an example of of who they wanted to be. Um, yeah, my first uh, novel, I, I thought I was writing about one thing. And I was writing about that thing, and it is still there. But when I got done, I started looking at the characters and and why they were how they were. And I realized that I had written a book where every character had an absent or abusive father, <laughs> which wow. might say something. Yeah, I think uh, so. So uh, like many heavy readers, first it came through reading. Mm -hmm. I would read something, fictional or not, and I would say, this is an example that I want to follow. Um, as as cheesy as it sounds, even comic books, right? This is how uh, a moral hero behaves. And this is how I want to be as a person. Um, as an aside, I'm just so excited that Captain America is such a popular character now. Um, because it gives me hope. Uh, that all our heroes don't have to be anti-heroes. They can simply be good people uh, with good intentions. But I would say instructor-wise, it was my Wing Chun instructor who um, I took the, he was a living, breathing, close example of the things that I had been reading, uh, someone who was considerate, um, someone who was measured, who had worked through their anger uh, and come out the other side and grown. Um, you know, uh, I had a lot of anger 
as a younger person. Um, I never, <laughs> I've written about this, but as a martial artist, I was never out to ever hurt anybody. I actually hate hurting people um, in any context, but all in, in a physical context. I'm never out to injure anybody or hurt anybody. It feels so bad when you hurt somebody, um, when you, when you get them, you know, they're the distances, uh, suddenly shrink and you didn't foresee that. Uh, and you get somebody a little more solid than you meant to, it, it just feels terrible. And, um, it's, it was more about being able to endure hardship. Um, being able to prove that I could take it rather than deliver it, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, I would say it was uh, my Wichita instructor, uh, Sean Paul, uh, that was that, that uh, example. Before that, um, I had trained uh, in a, uh, some traditional martial arts, uh, again, uh, judo, taekwondo, and, and karate. Um, but I had not made a personal connection with any of the instructors. These were big schools. These were these were younger pe classes for younger people. Um, and uh, I had not found that intimate connection that I... Uh, that I think that I was really seeking. Hmm. That awareness now probably sheds a lot of light on some things that you did then, mm -hmm. earlier. Mm -hmm. Are there situations that you think about in your past, things that you, you did said that you have a little more self-compassion with yeah. that perspective yeah i i don't look back i don't have any horror stories where i did anything um i don't have my i don't have any cobra kai stories <laughs> <laughs> well that's too bad sense. i mean there's no. episodes at a grinding halt now no I'm just kidding. I, I don't have any of those stories i do have stories where um I, I did run into people who I felt were being deceptive. Um, all of us who train, especially traditionally, have run into people that are not who they are pretending to be. They're claiming uh, experience or a lineage that they, um, that they don't possess. And if I ran into a person yeah. like that that was instructing, I would... Uh, I would boil over a little bit because I didn't like the idea of this person as an ego exercise, um, leading someone down a, a false path. I, I, it incensed me. Uh, being from Michigan, that is a person we, uh, you know, as martial artists, we know when someone can't trace their lineage, that's generally a sign that perhaps they're not being truthful about their history, about their martial arts experience. It, being from Michigan, uh, the, it's always, they always learn from a guy up north. Like some, <laughs> some uh, up north in Michigan is the Upper Peninsula. It's uh, the wilderness. Um, they, when you run into those guys and they're, and they're teaching, I would get a little upset. Um, <laughs> Like I said, I used to carry around sparring gear in my car, you know, I, in my trunk, I had all my stuff. And if I was in a situation uh, in my early 20s where someone would be uh, bragging uh, or making claims, I would say, well, you are in luck. Let's find out. Let's see where we stand. Why was that so important to you? Uh, a gear bag with two sets of gear, I think you said earlier, it was two sets. Yeah. It takes up a bunch of space. Unless you're rolling around in a, yeah. you know, a Suburban or something, you, you, that was intentional. There, there, was, there was real value on keeping that and the opportunity 
to check that person. Yeah. Why was that so critical for you? That is a great question. I don't know. At the time, I I felt that I put in all this hard work um, and that I had uh, ironically gained a sense of humility and realism about where I was. People uh, always talk about that. They say, uh, you know, you have a lot of humility or you're a humble person. And I said, it's because I've trained for so long. And when you train for a long time, you know exactly where you stand. Um, you have touched gloves. You've been in there with professionals, with mm. truly amazingly talented people, people whose talent, drive, desire uh, that I could never match. Um, and you have no illusions about yourself, you, oh, where you stand. And um, for some reason, when I would run into an illusionist, it would, it would. Was a good description? Yes, it would get me, it would, it, it would rile me up. Um, not, not so much anymore. Okay. I, I think it's an important thing to unpack because the motivation for that likely comes in, in my experience, because we spend a lot of time talking about ego on this show. Okay. I, I think really the the thrust of most martial arts journeys mm. involves ego, yeah. whether it's the buildup of ego because it didn't exist yes. or the breakdown or yes. the restructure, right? It's, it's all, it seems to be all ego. And I think that there are a lot of people who are in the midst of that ego journey and what it what it sounds like mm -hmm. was in your 20s there was a defensiveness of mm -hmm. what you had done because if somebody else wasn't representing the thing that you love the thing you had invested mm -hmm. so much into that it maybe reflected poorly on you almost like a, a martial arts vigilante not the use of martial arts as a vigilante sure. but a vigilante in defense of martial arts Yes, I I think that is extremely insightful. Insightful. I've never really thought of it that way, but you, you're right. Um, ego does play a, a huge part, and I think too at that time I was probably a little prideful. Uh, yeah. You know, at that age, uh, you're at a physical peak uh, that you maybe never been at, especially if you're also um, weight training and and conditioning um so i'm also sure ego did play a part in it you know i felt that i was running on all cylinders mm -hmm. and i uh, was happy to demonstrate it um and, but yes i i think that's i think that's very insightful actually uh so i've learned something today <laughs> Well, good, good. At least there's a little bit of value exchange. You're, you're being so generous with your time and, and being open with your stories. Uh, and, you know, it's the, the reason I can point to that story is because, you know, it's, it's my story to a certain degree. You know, that, that early 20 stage for someone who started training when they were quite young, which is also my genesis. And, you know, by the time you hit 20, 22, 25, you've got a lot of time in physically likely at your peak yeah. probably at the peak of your own uh opinion of your skill yeah. yes and it's not always a healthy combination no and it takes a really strong instructor to guide that person and i think that that is part of why we see quite a few people transition and not, not just in martial arts but just in life you know there's a lot of transition that happens in the early to mid 20s because of that, you know, we were, uh, you know, you're, ah, right. I, I, there isn't even a word. It's just that, that tone there. Ah, yeah. Right? That I think we can, a, lo a lot of us at least can, can empathize with. Yes. I definitely, you know, also this idea of, uh, preparedness, you know, um, I've always been a person, um, with a strong imagination. 
Hmm. So, um, you know, uh, as embarrassing as it sounds, I've always been ready for a, a ninja to pop out of the door. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the only one. Oh, this is fantastic. Right. right. <laughs> it, I, I'm sure there are a bunch of people listening going, oh, it's not just me. Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> if somebody sat up in my backseat right now, I know what I'm going to do. I'm ready. Um, You've acted this out. Oh, sure. Um, you know, uh, that's actually in Tao Ji Kune Do, right? Where Bruce Lee is saying, you know, visualize different situations and what you would do in those situations, you know. And uh, I have been caught uh, by friends and family who've turned the corner at the wrong time when I'm having a little uh, mental exercise, uh, telling a little story in my head. It's mm -hmm. embarrassing. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. You're in good company here, my friend. Oh, good, good. Yeah. How, how is that? Because you, you mentioned this earlier, and I think this is probably a great time to talk about it. Now we've connected a couple dots. You, you mentioned that you've written. Yeah. How has that imagination, coupled with your own journey and, and you know, these personal right. aspects to some characters, how has that expressed in your writing? Sure. So I, um, I always did want to write, but I didn't have a lot of confidence in it. Um, I don't come from a background of, uh, I didn't get a, a degree in writing or a, an MFA or any of these things that you get, you know, I, I, my degrees are in criminal justice. So, uh, cause I wanted to be a superhero. Let's be honest. I wanted <laughs> nice. to be Batman. I was doing martial arts and training criminal justice in college. Come on. What, what were, what were my end goals here? So, um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, here's a wonderful thought. I, I'm, I'm going to derail this, but I think yes. you can pull it back because sure. I think this will be fun. Yeah. How interesting would it be if we could exist in some world where we could conduct the experiment? Yes. For how many of us is it yes. the mere lack of a few billion dollars that separates us from I being know. Batman? I know. If, I mean, if you gave it. me, I mean, within 12 months, yes. I would run out of all the other things that I really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I would be Batman. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it sounds like you would too. And I bet there's a bunch of people listening saying, yeah, yeah it'd probably be me as well. Yeah. I mean, um, having grown up on a steady diet of comic books um, and been training and then decided to go to school for criminal justice, uh, definitely, definitely in my head. <laughs> uh, before I understood that that job is a service job, um, it's not. It's not what you imagine. It is, thankfully. Um, yes, I definitely was preparing for that. And if you did have that budget, um, and those are some of my favorite Batman stories, is when you would dig into his past and you'd be traveling around the world and finding all these amazing teachers um, to, to instruct him. Um, so wanting to wanting to write, um, you have to find your voice. And uh, as much as we like to think of writing as art, um, just like martial arts, it takes a lot of uh, sweat, a lot of elbow grease, a lot of dedication. Um, just like wanting to be a, a skilled martial artist, uh, we wish that we were just naturally gifted and that without even trying, we were perfect. But that was not my writing journey. I had to write four books and I had to write poorly and I had to be honest with myself and I had to attack uh, my weaknesses and I had to break down my uh, illusion of where I stood in terms of my, my writing, my writing skills. It took a while and, um, it was inevitable that anything I wrote, uh, the character in some way, shape or form was a martial artist. Um, I, I like writing action scenes. I love write, writing fight scenes, maybe too mm. much, but I love more <laughs> getting into the, the head of how does a person who has trained for a long time think? Um, 
so my debut book, uh, the character in the book is a lifetime martial artist uh, who, uh, through a fluke uh, event, uh, appears in a film of a famous movie franchise that has lost its lead actor. And they need someone to step into this famous movie role and play the character because if the movie isn't complete in 30 days, they're going to lose the rights to the entire franchise. So this is a, a take on the idea that we have to have a Spider-Man movie every three years. Mm -hmm. And if we don't, Sony is going to lose the ability to make Spider-Man movies. So the director losing the, losing the original actor decides, I'm just going to shoot a martial arts schlock film. I'm just going to shoot an uh, a dirty action movie. So he goes to a martial arts tournament, looks for a skilled martial artist who looks close to what the main character is supposed to look like and casts him in a movie. And this is a young man who has no idea what he's doing. And it's a disaster. And this is 18 years before the book starts. And he is now, when the book starts, in his late 30s. He has a lot more perspective. And he has been uh, ridiculed on a daily basis by the internet for his horrible portrayal in this movie. Mm. And it has caused him to have a lot of perspective and a lot of empathy for other people because he knows what it's like to be the target of ridicule. So um, I wanted to write a book about a, a lifetime martial artist that showed somebody's um, perspective and showed how they went through uh, tough experiences but came out a better person. Um, I've actually been very pleased that as I've gotten older, I didn't become the crotchety old man that I thought I was going to be. That I have a lot more empathy uh, for people and um, that I root for people. That the older I get, the less bitterness I possess. I am very pleased and refreshed that this is the path I'm going on. Mm. Um, because I think a lot of people, when they get older, they there's there's a fork in the road. Do you think that there's a way? Let's let's longtime listeners know this has become a a favorite question of mine, mm. but I always tweak it a little bit. Do you think yeah. there's a way that if time travel existed, that you could go back to some point? and shave off some of the time that shedding that bitterness took. Could you advise yourself in such a way that you would listen to you or did you need to experience it? Yeah. Did you need to experience it? Um, did, did you need to experience it? I, I would say you might actually do your past self more harm than good. Um, what if I go back to my past self and say, hey, guess what? This all works out. Um, all these things that you're concerned about, um, all this time you're putting in, it's worth it. You're not wasting it. Um, keep on doing what you're doing. Uh, it's yielding results. Um, would past me then get a little uh, full of himself and say, well, look at me. <laughs> All right. <laughs> he should have been more specific about what behaviors. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I love it. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, that's interesting. I, I think I do... Uh, my bad pondering is the idea of, of appearing in my younger body with my present knowledge. 
right? The impossible situation that you wake up and it's, you have the, the knowledge you've gained in the last 20 years, but you have those 20 years back. It's probably a good thing we don't get that. Probably. Now, what about sort of the inverse of that question? What if you had the opportunity to go forward in time? 20 years, talk to older you, sit down, have a cup of coffee. Yeah. Um, would you? Yeah, I would hope I wouldn't have to buy him the coffee. Because <laughs> <laughs> coffee in 20 years is going to be, you know, yeah. $18,000. Um, I haven't really been someone who is, uh, I'm not a guy that pursues material wealth. Um, I'm someone who likes to be comfortable. But that's not what's important to me. I think our most important uh, resource in life is our time. Mm -hmm. Our time is our most valuable thing. It's limited and you have to preserve it. And um, I think it's because I came from this blue collar place here, Metro Detroit, where um, as I was graduating high school, people could still walk right off, uh, grab their diploma, and then walk into a factory. Um, and I watched factory life, the grind of factory life. And I did not take to it well. I said, I need to find a path in life where my time is my own. So that's been a deliberate choice um, to value uh, time over money. Um, to make the money that I need to to pursue my goals, but that my goals aren't simply accumulation. Um, so I, like I'm saying, I'm in 20 years. I would hope I wouldn't have to buy my older self uh, coffee, uh, because if I saw my older self and he was like, "Hey, what say we work on our 401k a little more than what we're doing right now?" <laughs> 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 hey younger me can i get some stock picks yeah um you were gonna get around to this stuff pal nice. i'm uh i don't know about uh other other martial artists i i'd love to have real discussions with with other people that train uh but my wife is is always commenting about how hard i am on myself how critical i am of myself um, I demand a lot out of myself and I do not demand it out of anybody else. Um, I'm very, uh, accepting of other people's efforts and very understanding, but I, I, the bar that I place on myself has always been very high. Um, and my wife, uh, she comments, I need to take it easier on myself. And I tell her, why don't you do that? Why don't you take it easy on me? Because I'm not able to. I don't. Where can people find your book? Books? Book. Oh, uh, yeah. So um, this is my debut novel. It just uh, oh. it just came out uh, less than a month ago now. Some good timing. Um, yeah. Well, let's, you know, I have to be someone worth talking to. So I'm starting to appear on more things. Everyone is worth talking to. If yes. you if you dig into our back catalog, you will see it's truthful that yes. in my opinion, many of our strongest episodes are with what people would call everyday martial artists. Yes. I I absolutely agree with you. Um so uh it was a long journey to publication. Mm -hmm. Um and uh, it, it's tough being a traditionally published writer, uh, getting a literary agent, uh, finding a publisher willing to invest in you, um, and then and sticking through a painful. There's a lot of rejection. Uh, and if you go the traditional writing route, you're going to hear no a lot, and you're going to deal with harsh criticism, even if it comes from a, a place of love. Uh, professionals will not be gentle with you. Uh, so we worked hard. I worked hard on this book. I'm really pleased with 
how much martial arts I was able to get into it without being overly technical. Because remember, the book is being read by the layman as well as uh, hopefully experienced martial artists who will identify with what's going on in the book, uh, not just the action scenes, which I feel I do a, a decent job on, but the the internal experience of the martial artists in the book and how they look at life and and how they um, use their subset of skills to read people because this is a martial artist who's a detective so he he uses his knowledge of uh, his observations because you know as martial artists we uh, learn to evaluate people very quickly in terms of where they're at how they move um the the assuredness of their motions we we can kind of quickly pin uh, where somebody's at in their own journey and what that means for us if we're encountering them. But anyway, my book is available wherever books are sold. Um, you know, you can go to your uh, your big places, your Amazons, Barnes & Noble. Uh, the publisher is CamCat. You can just simply go to the CamCat Books site. Um, uh, I guess I, I am uh, Joe Crawford. Uh, is my name but uh, when I started dating my wife she tried to google foo me she tried to get on google and find all my dirt and she to her dismay my name is too common and there were too many Joe Crawfords and she bemoaned that she could not find my dark secrets and I thought I am going to need a pen name because if you Google Joe Crawford author, you're never going to get it. So that's why I, I, my pen name is J.A. Crawford, which is just my first two initials, J.A. Crawford. And the book is Jove Brand is Near Death. And it is a action-packed, humorous mystery that is a run-up on a certain famous super spy franchise that many of us know and love mm. it was a lot of fun to make up a fictional movie franchise that has been going on for 50 years and sort of comment on the evolution of the super spy on the evolution of uh a character uh who in the book i refer to as all the is you know anything ending in ist you know <laughs> um and uh has that concept become dated and how does that evolve into the modern day um we i think everyone has an inner detective um everyone does have we all have our observant side and uh Finding my detective character and this Ken Allen character, who, because it's a first person narrative, uh, we share a lot in common. Um, someone who has been weathered by life and weathered it well. Life has eroded him into a fine polish rather than wear him down. And um, I think readers will like going on a journey with old Ken. He's a good guy. He's a uh, he's a wholesome guy. Actually, he's he doesn't have a lot of darkness in him. I think the trend right now in our uh, fiction has been characters with a lot of darkness in them. Yeah, and uh, I I don't like you know I enjoy um, I'm a big fan of Lee Child. I love the Jack Reacher books. I I, I like that stuff, but I also I want to get back to um, good men doing good things. Uh, with, and uh, a, a guy who doesn't want to hurt anybody, um, but wants to find the truth. And uh, so the, the book is Joe. I, I have to remember this. I'm a budding author. So you have to excuse me. I forget to promote myself. <laughs> the book I do. Uh, the book is Joe Brand is Near Death. And 
Uh, I recently uh, signed the contract and turned in the sequel book, uh, which is about superheroes. It's a continuation of the same series uh, where the Ken Allen character is uh, hired as someone starts murdering the actors who play superheroes in superhero movies. Uh, someone starts murdering the actors behind the masks, and Ken has to unravel who is this person killing heroes. Uh, because I really wanted to write a book about role models, about who we choose to be our heroes and what we look for in our heroes. But I also wanted to write a book about the people who created heroes and how we treated those people who created the heroes that we know and we love. Um, it's a topic near and dear to my heart. Nice. How about social media, websites, anything else like that that our listeners should know about? Oh, sure. Um, so I, um, I've been criticized with this by my publicist, but many years ago, uh, you are I, being uh, too hard on yourself. Yes. Your wife's right. That's okay. Please continue. Uh, but you have to love something to be good at it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so uh, basically everywhere I am Joseph of Orb, just like John Carter of Mars. Uh, mm. I am Joseph of Orb. So J-O-S-E-P-H O-F-O-R-B. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. Um, actually, just yesterday, uh, it became official that I am now a mentor in the Pitch Wars program, which is a writing program uh, where it's free. You submit to mentors and uh, they, they would, out of a large pool of, of people who apply, they choose someone to mentor and they go through a, your, your manuscript with you. They help guide you through a revision. Uh, they help level up your skills and get you closer to your writing goals. So I was in this program in 2018 and soon after signed with a literary agent and had a book deal. It's a very effective program for a budding writer. Um, I highly recommend it because it is free. It's writers helping writers. It does. It, there's no downside to just trying. And even if you aren't selected, many of us will turn around and give you uh, helpful feedback um, about your work. Uh, so I just announced as a mentor yesterday on Twitter there, uh, Joseph of Orb. I'm going to do my best to post more Instagram photos and videos, people. I'm, I'm trying. Um, uh, my wife is very encouraging about taking pictures of me and such. Uh, and uh, I've been making wooden man videos on TikTok and this kind of thing, too. I love my wooden. I love my mook junk. Nice. He's a constant companion now for more than 20 years. So <laughs> uh, back in the day, uh, I used to decorate him for Christmas, put the lights on him and a top hat like a snowman. Good old Luke John. Yeah. Right on. Well, this has been great. I appreciate you coming on and, and wow. just going deep on it. Well, thanks we got, so much we got for some good stuff. Me. Yeah. I, I got to tell you, I can't, I, I'm, uh, Sometimes I know I can be too forward and too direct, but uh, why why waste our time on the surface? Let's get into this. I agree. You know? Don't be. We can't be scared about confronting ourselves. That's what martial arts is. Uh, it's it's a self exploration. It's discovering yourself. It's discovering who you are, how you approach stressful situations. Um, how someone engages in martial arts tells you a lot about their personality, um, how they how they engage in these stressful situations, how they learn. Um, it's been such a valuable tool for me. It is impossible for me to imagine a life where I was not a martial artist because it was so formative in in who i am today um and you know you have these discussions with your spouse if you're going to have children uh well would you ever force your child to do anything 
I wouldn't force them to continue to do something. But the idea of not introducing my child to martial arts and letting them find their martial art, their what speaks to them. Um, and for me, it was an eclectic mix of things. I, I'm, a, I'm a forever student. I love moving from discipline to discipline. Um, I think it was Dan and Santo that said, I love putting on a white belt. You know, I love it. Uh, recently, I've been doing Western martial arts, uh, like HEMA, like broadsword martial arts and these things. And it's just been such a fascinating uh, change of pace. But uh, I'm so glad you had me on today. Thank you so much um, because uh, this is a topic near and dear to my heart. It's, it's central to my being. And it's, it's great to uh, meet a kindred soul. Like I told you at the top, that was a great conversation. One that you might even want to go back and listen to again, because there was a lot in there. I really want to thank Joe for coming on and for just doing what he did. I hope you all will check out his book and give him a shout on social media. If you want to go deeper, make sure you hit whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Check out the episode. Check out the other episodes, transcripts, notes, all that. Sign up for the newsletter so you can stay up on everything we're doing for this show and for the other things that we've got going on. And if you like what we do, if you value this organization and our efforts, there are ways you can help. You can tell friends, leave reviews, buy books, buy products at whistlekick.com, use the code PODCAST15. You can check out our other content. Anything you do that helps us grow is of value. And of course, we've got the Patreon. Oh, and remember, we have a strength and conditioning program. And I made it, and it's awesome, and people love it. And you can check it out at whistlekickprograms.com. If you have guest suggestions, topic suggestions, feedback for the show, anything like that, let me know. Jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media is at whistlekick. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>